Welcome to another ep- episode of Coffee Break. This is Steve Barrett, Editorial Director of PR Week. Really delighted to be here with Robert Gibbs, who's Senior Counsel at Bully Pulpit Interactive. And obviously, Robert, we know you well from McDonald's, from the White House, where you were Press Secretary to President Obama and long career in politics. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Steve. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. We'll chat about Bully Pulpit and uh, other stuff, but... I wanted to start with the state of the country at the moment. We're talking on the Thursday, the last day of the uh, Republican convention. It's been another extraordinary week um, of troubling incidents. You know, we're seeing uh, police shooting another black man. We're seeing a, a 17-year-old kid out on the streets with a, a semi-automatic it's killing two people. What's going on in America? I mean, and how do you sort of make sense of it? Well, I think, you know... <laughs> It feels like we get weeks and months worth of news packed into one day. Uh, and I think we're trying to get used to that. I think uh, I, I, the country does feel a bit on edge, uh, undoubtedly, whether you're in a big city or in a rural area. I think uh, COVID has a big part to do with that. But I think we've seen, um, you know, look, whether it's a leadership vacuum in certain places, whether it's, uh, you know, just feels like things aren't as stitched together as they need to be. And it feels um, a little like a country that is used to being um, a collective is devolved into a bit more of uh, a series of individuals. And I I hope, um, and and maybe some of that's in the political season. and, And when we get past that, we'll have the opportunity to stitch it back a little bit together. Yeah, it does seem like a perfect storm, doesn't it? With like five months of lockdown from COVID, everything is concentrated, super concentrated. Uh, issues of racial injustice over the past three months as well. What's your view on the stance that's been taken by sports stars and athletes? I saw the Bucks last night, uh, you know, not coming out to play and a lot of the other basketball teams and baseball and other sports followed, following suit. What do you make of their stance? Well, I, I think it was smart, and I think it, it – look, I, I think it has to be authentic, uh, as any uh, stand has to be like that. And I think you could tell – you could tell this was – when you saw this even as as the George Floyd murder happened and basketball was talking about restarting, there was – this was on the minds of those now. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, LeBron James famously – decouples from social media at the beginning of the playoffs. And for him to say a few days ago, you know, half his mind is focused on the playoffs and half his mind is focused on um, the lives uh, of Americans and particularly black Americans, I, I think is a stunning thing. Um, and so I, I think it, it, it puts pressure on different places. It puts pressure on our political leaders. It puts pressure on our brand leaders and our CEOs. I think, um, I, I think, consumers are going to expect more out of brands. They're going to expect that it isn't just a check that you're willing to write to a community organization, but are, are you willing to get your house in order on things like diversity and inclusion? Are you willing to, to be out there and take the steps that are necessary uh, to be part of this conversation and not have it feel fake uh, and not have it feel inauthentic? And I think that is only going to get stronger for brands. And I think the expectation uh, is only going to get stronger. And I think, you know, particularly if Vice President Biden wins this election, which that's not a prediction, but uh, if he does, I think what will be expected of brands is going to even even increase more. I think, for instance, if you've been thinking about a sustainability goal and you didn't want to outline what you were going to do on climate change as a brand, that's going to likely have to change if Joe Biden wins and we get back into the Paris Climate Accords. You're not going to be able to get away with sort of a, a fuzzy goal. You're going to have to say, what are you going to do on this? On things like diversity and inclusion, you're going to have to take big steps. Again, I don't think it's just going to be writing a check anymore. I think that what's expected is going to be um, a lot more, uh, and it's going to be front and center as people make decisions on where to take their business. Yeah, we've seen that today with lots of brands tweeting about um, the, uh, the boycotts and the sporting, uh, the athletes' decisions there. But- you're right. They've got to go beyond that. You know, just putting a tweet out there doesn't cut it anymore, does it? It's got to be actions, and it's got to be it's got to be authentic as well. You spent time at McDonald's as head of communications, a global company, forty thousand sites. Um, how did you make that um, balance between 
being being a business and making profits, but also being pur purposeful and acting in a way that uh, modern consumers and employees now have really come to demand. Well, I was going to say, I think this all starts internally, right? And so I think the siloing of internal and external com communications this year has completely uh, uh, eroded away. I, I just don't think there is any difference between an internal story now and an external story, because a lot of the pressure you've seen uh, is coming internally. Employees want to know what companies are going to do, even before uh, consumers do. And I think it's imperative that companies are having those conversations uh, internally. It, it's really important to do that. And if, if they're missing that opportunity, um, you know, we all know that consumers can can use their feet to go somewhere else, but so too can employees. And it impacts how you recruit. It impacts uh, the type of culture you have. And it's really imperative for brands to focus in and understand that. How do you do that as a brand when you want customers from all sides of the divide? And we are very polarized as a, as a society. But you want Republicans, you want Democrats buying your, your food or engaging right. with your brand. How do you strike that balance? And, and the same with employees. You'll have employees on both sides of the divide, too. It's a difficult thing to strike, isn't it? It, it is. And I think brands have to be careful. I don't, I don't think personally brands should become governments and have necessarily have an opinion on, on everything that happens uh, or every piece of legislation. But I do think brands need to understand where uh, both employees and, and consumers think they can make the biggest difference, where they can put their thumb on the scale. So for instance, in a, in a place like McDonald's, you know, we talked about scale for good because um, nobody, everybody understands uh, you've got about 40,000 restaurants throughout the world. You, you're, a, you're a big organization. And our theory was we could use that size and scale, that bigness, if you will, um, you know, to, to make some real positive actions, whether it was on, again, climate change or on recycling, uh, you know, our impact in communities. I think those types of things people really want to see. And I, I think it's important to understand the role that you can play in people's lives, the role they see you playing in people's lives, and how you can leverage that role to make those lives and the communities you operate in better. That's really imperative. I don't think people want, they, they get enough politics, quite frankly. I don't think they want their brands to be commenting on politics each and every day. Yeah, for sure. And talking of politics, we're in convention season. It's a very different convention season to the ones that you will have experienced. Totally virtual. Um, we're speaking on the final day of the Republican convention. What have you made of the virtual formats and the respective parties' approaches to doing a virtual convention? Well, I think thus far they've worked really well for, for both sides, quite frankly. I think if you take the, the speeches that Michelle and Barack Obama gave, uh, I think doing those in um, in an intimate setting without a crowd uh, where you can sort of feel like you're in a one on one conversation with both of them and you can focus on the words and the meaning. I think that really lifted the impact of those speeches. On the other hand, I, I, I think, you know, Vice President Pence was pretty effective last night giving a speech, even with a limited crowd, but that needed some applause. He was giving a speech that needed that. So I think in many ways it's worked for uh, for each one of them. I think the challenge going forward is going to be we continue to see viewership drop off, right? Um, and and I, that's happened really in both conventions. And and I think you're going to, each of the parties is going to have to figure this out. It, it It is very much and follows very closely uh, what we've seen happen writ large with communications, right? There are just fewer and fewer people that are watching broadcast television each day. And I think if anything, COVID has accelerated those trends. I mean, we talk about it at BPI that we're really seeing 2025 viewership trends in 2020 because people are walking away from that, again, not walking away, from, they're just seeing less of that broadcast. And it's also not a world in which you can live in and say, well, let's do broadcasts in one social media network or what have you. It's a whole array of whether it's it's streaming, whether it's gaming, lots of different places where you can put your messages in lots of places for people to think through. And I think if political parties, brands, causes, organizations are going to have to increasingly go where people are and put the content they want and need to see where they are. And that's that's only going to get more accelerated. We've seen it already. 
uh, and it's it's not going to slow down. Yeah, we've got to measure in a different way, I think, because yeah, cable numbers are down or broadcast numbers are down, but people are consuming media in a different way. They might be getting bite-sized chunks on YouTube or on social. Absolutely. They just consume in a different way generally. Even in four years, that's changed uh, really radically. So we've got to come up, you know, a like-for-like -like broadcast tells some of the story, but it doesn't tell all of the story because Absolutely. You know, they're consuming in a different way. Absolutely. But that brings us to Bully Pulpit Interactive. You've done the client side, you've done politics, you had a go at uh, your own agency, I think, when you came out of the White House. Now you've joined Bully Pulpit. What was the attraction of that uh, outfit? And, and what? tell us a little bit about the type of work you're doing. Yeah, well, BPI bought the uh, the agency that uh, that I had helped to start after oh, right. I left politics. So, Insight agency, right? Insight agency, right. So I knew a lot of those guys uh, in in. in men and women were friends, right? So it was Im important. I wanted to go someplace that uh, and, uh, people I enjoyed working with. And uh, BPI was also, uh, I was a client, they were a client, uh, I should say, at uh, at McDonald's. Or I was, let me, I was a client. I don't know if you can edit this. Yeah, I, I yeah, was, yeah. They were, you were uh, a client of theirs. I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> they worked for me at McDonald's. I'll do this like that. <laughs> uh, BPI worked for me at McDonald's. And so I think... Um, I saw the the level of, of work that they were able to do. Uh, they competed with, uh, and quite frankly, uh, were better than maybe even some of the bigger firms uh, in in the country and globally. And so I was deeply impressed with their work. And I thought, if you can go work with people that you like uh, and do really high quality work for 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 brands, for causes, uh, for for big organizations, that that's a win win. Yeah, for sure. And uh, do you prefer that councillor role, um, which was probably maybe a bit closer to the political role than being in-house, or do you, is it just different? Oh, I think it's different. And, and look, I, I think the, the, best, uh, the best consulting feels like you're adding to that in-house uh, structure, that you feel like you get a lift of people that are uh, just as obsessed as an in-house person would be in, in what you're doing. So I, I, I think... I think you've got to be able to do both. And I think if you're adding that um, force multiplier, if you will, you feel again like you're just adding to the structure that you already have. Yeah, I spoke to Alex Conant for the last edition of Coffee Break, and he's someone who came out of politics and into agency at Firehouse. You see people like Jay Carney has gone in-house, Josh Ernest at United, Dan Bartlett at Walmart. So the skills that you learn in politics are obviously very um, appropriately deployed in, a, in a, a corporate setting. What do you think those skills are and why, why are those skills so sought after in the corporate realm? Yeah, it's a great question. I think part of it is, uh, or a big part of it is, look, it's pacing, right? It, you get up in politics every day and you've got to go find uh, new voters in that sense. And I think in communications, you got to go find new evangelists, right? You got to go find new partners, new advocates for, for what you're trying to do. I think also in politics, you have a very defined set of end goals. Uh, and a compact timeline uh, and a limited budget with which to accomplish that. And so I, I think if you hire somebody with that political background, you get somebody who understands what that ultimate KPI and goal is. They understand how quickly you have to get it done and how continually you have to do it. Yeah, and it's fast-paced and non-stop, isn't it, which is, you know, the political world. Just to finish up then, look, what's Give us a bit of uh, optimism for the future. What's what's the one or two things we need to do as a as a country, as a as corporate citizens, you know, as businesses, to just make make the country better? I mean, we we need to get we need to do better than this, don't we? Yeah, I, th I look, I I think, and I'm again, I'm hopeful that after maybe a little bit after the political season, we can kind of exhale and uh, and I think realize in a way that we're all in this together. Uh, right. And it, it, it's not, um, you know, part of us aren't going to succeed and part of us fail. I think the beauty in the experiment of us as a country has always been uh, that we're in it together and, and that out of, uh, you know, out, out of many is one. And I think we've got to get back to hopefully a, a conversation that is uh, more talking and less yelling uh, and more understanding uh, of what we can agree on and instead of focusing only on what we disagree on. 
Yeah, and being able to have a conversation and, and maybe have different views, but not hate the other person at the end of it, right? Fundamentally, I mean, and look, the truth is whether, whether it's politics or anything else, if you can't sit down with that in mind and understand that you have commonalities and, and common interests, if you can't understand that, and if, if it all is derived by hating the person you're sitting across from, it's really hard to make progress. And I would say um, very few of our, our problems get better with age. They're not like wine, right? You can't put it in the cellar and you open it up a few years later and it's better, right? It's, uh, it, a lot of things need to be dealt with now and they, they need partners on both sides to do it. Absolutely. Well, uh, nice, nice words to finish on. Thank you, Robert, for joining us on Coffee Break and uh, good luck at Bully Pulpit Interactive. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.